Hey everyone, it's Reese from Fishman Aquatics, and today we are with Jen, who is an expert in water quality, who's a chemist by trade. Um, so we're going to take you through all of the basics to do with water quality. We're going to go into a beginner section and then go into a bit more of an, an advanced style step section. So, hello Jen. Hello. How are you? Me, fine. Good, good. So, you've been keeping fish for a while, I take it? Just a, just a little bit, yes. I mean, I'm not going to ask you into the years because I find it a little bit rude, but how did it all start? Like, when was your first aquarium or what was the the interest peaking when you were a kid? Well, I've always been, I've always been into animals. And I used to, started off catching tadpoles and growing them up into frogs. And then one of my school friends, her dad had a fish tank. And I would constantly go to Lorna's house to see her dad's fish tank. It wasn't so much to see her. And my mum and dad got me an aquarium for my Christmas when I was about 13. And I kept all sorts of things in it. I had chickawoods. Oh, um, no, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> um, a angel fish, dwarf grammys, neon tetras, guppies, red-tailed black shark, corridoris. So you went through the whole normal community aquarium thing. I mean, I think everyone went through the whole red tail, black shark, neon tetra kind of phase as well. Um, I had them as well. Oh, okay. Right. Um, yeah, so that was when you were about 13 then? Yeah. And you kind of peaked off and carried on from there? Yeah, as I say, I then had moved house and I had a five foot tank that had half a dozen tin foil barbs in it, which were rather large fish. Um, then gradually I got, got multi-tank syndrome, as most people do. As everybody does. Yes. And various fish over the years. And then I got a small nano tank because I fancied some clown loaches. Uh, not clown loaches, clown fish. Yeah, I was going to say that's probably not the right fish for a nano tank. No. The two black and white clown fish that I fancied. So got them, and then I kind of overstocked it, but you do this. And then I've got a big corner unit that I put more marine fish in. And then I've got a six foot tank that I put marine fish in. So I had other like, three, three foot tanks dotted round about the house with aquatic frogs and various, what was it, I had dual cichlids. Never ever get dual cichlids. Murder me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, I'll get Callum to bleep that bit out because I do sell them. Um, so, yeah, Callum can yeah, just edit that little bit. Um, but yes, they are murderous little buggers. Yes. Although not as bad as the clownfish, which has proven to me to be the most aggressive fish I've ever worked with. Yeah, they bit me once when I was cleaning the tank out. Yeah, I mean, I used to work in a wholesalers and there was the anemone kind of section in there and there was one clownfish that had that as his home and at least three times a day he would bite me. Mm -hmm. I found the maroon clown to be the most vicious. He was a maroon clown. Yeah. <laughs> Absolute yeah. nightmares. Perk clowns, not too bad. Mm -hmm. So as I say I had mandarins and the gobies and different things and in the freshwater tanks. I had goldfish, which were murder to keep. I would much rather clean out a six foot marine tank than a goldfish tank. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Try to learn that to everybody. Yes. No one agrees. It's so annoying. Well, in terms of customers anyway. So in terms of your educational background, um, Obviously, you didn't do education with fish related subjects. It was more along the science and chemistry. So what is the background in science for you? Um, me being a very pedantic person fell out with the director and head teacher of the school because I wanted to do all three sciences as old grades. But being a woman in the 1980s, that was not the done thing. You had to diversify. 
Yeah, this 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 video is diversified already. Now you've mentioned that, so let's let's continue with that for a little bit. Um, I didn't want to do geography. I didn't want to do history. I didn't want to do German. I wanted to do chemistry and biology and physics. So my mum and dad and I sat in the rector and headmaster's office and had an argument with them as to why I wasn't allowed to do it just because I was a girl. Nice. So, and I won. <laughs> well, I can, yeah, I, can, I kind of knew the outcome of that as you started talking about it, because obviously that is where you carried on. So that mm -hmm. was school. Obviously you were allowed to do science as a woman in the 1980s, so well done to you. Um, how did it move on from that? Um, I got, uh, when I left the school, I got a youth training programme at the Hannah Deary Research, where I was working with animals and plotting milking records and doing analysis and goat's milk and cow's milk and sheep milk and see what the differences were. And then I moved to Cross House Hospital, where I worked in a clinical chemistry lab, testing blood samples. So, so if you go to the doctor and get a blood test done, I know how to check your glucose and your urea and electrolytes and liver function tests and stuff like that. So if I ever want a cheap blood test done, just in case, <laughs> can, I, can I send it? I'm sure, I'm sure I could find some. I've still got people that work there, so we could work something out. Okay, uh, okay. well, that's, that's good when I get too scared to go to the doctors, so... Yeah. Happy days. Need a bit. <laughs> right. So the relationship to what you did in science in terms of animals um, and working with fish and being able to understand uh, different parameters and things like that with water quality and the chemistry behind it. Mm -hmm. Was that just automatically spiked through what you did and your love for animals? Or was there a moment where it clicked and you thought you wanted to dive a little bit further into it? It's basically a case I wanted to play with test tubes. <laughs> okay. That was the simplest answer I could ever have thought of. But um, okay, I mean. You get fancy coloured solutions depending on what you're doing, then you work out why it's like that. And... Right, so it's kind of a scientific engineering mind behind the things that you do day to day with your own aquariums that spiked it. Yeah. So, and then you just. You get nerdy and you go into more detail and find out, so why does this happen? Why do I need this in the water? Why do I need to remove this and all the rest of it? So Good. And that is actually quite a nice little link for us to carry on with the next little bit as well. So we're going to look at all of that further on into the little video, uh, into the conversation. But first, what I think is good to look at for the beginners of the hobby is the cycling of aquariums. So taking things from the very, very start. So you've bought your new fish tank. Um, you're being told to cycle the aquarium. You might get told a little bit of information from the store where you bought things from. But obviously, you're going to forget about that by the time that you get back home. So okay. cycling aquarium, step one in terms of creating that ammonia source and creating the ecosystem. How does it work? Well, you need to, first of all, you need to decoordinate the water because chlorine's bleach and it would kill any bacteria. Yep. Which is the main thing to do. And check whether your water supply has chloramines in it as well as chlorine, because if you don't break them down properly, you end up with extra ammonia because chloramine's just chlorine joined with ammonia and then what I did with the wee tank that I've got there is I just put some bottled bacteria in it and put in some fish food and left it for a couple of weeks and then tested it until as I say you get the ammonia spike then you get the nitrate spike and then you get the nitrate spike and once I've got the nitrate up and the ammonia down to zero that's when I put fish in it. Right. I mean, I did. Think, I, I forgot to do a little plug. Callum was supposed to do um, something. So I need to mention about another video that we did um, where we talked about through the whole cycling process. Uh, so if anyone wants to go check that out in conjunction with this one and get all the information, uh, Callum will put something somewhere on the screen. <laughs> I don't know how it works. Um, so you create a money source in your tank. 
Pardon? What is the bacteria that will start to break that down? Like, where does it live and how does it come around? Mainly the nitrosomous bacteria, and it lives on surfaces. And you can either add it from a bottle, or you can be an extremely patient person, and it will be on your substrate and your decorations. And if you're putting plants in, you'll get the bacteria on the plants, but they're also in the air and round about. And the world's a dirty place. It's covered in bacteria. You will find them anywhere. All the germaphobes would love that extra little bit of information. Mm-hmm, yeah. So that's ammonia. Now, breaking down the ammonia to the nitrite, and then the nitrite to the nit nitrate, how does that process work? Well, the bacteria will eat the, the ammonia, which is a nitrogen we had hydrogens on it, NH3, and it'll use the oxygen in the water to take the hydrogen off, turn it into water and add more oxygen to the nitrogen, which will give you nitrite, which is NO2. And then there's a different bacteria. I'll add on an extra oxygen to give you NO3, which is nitrate. And then you can either use water changes to remove it, plants that will use the nitrate, or you can use an anoxic filtration, which will complete the nitrogen side and turn it back into nitrogen. Yeah, I mean, I've, had a, I've had a look at the bacteria that will remove nitrate and obviously you're not able to put them into a conventional filter. It'd have to be something completely different because the living conditions like the water flow over the surface and things like that is too fast in a conventional filter. Um, and there are things like the hydro filters out there that do break it down. Frankly, I've not tested them myself to prove their effectiveness, but they seem to be doing very, very well on the market at the moment. Yeah, as I say, I had a nitrate reduction filter when I had my marine tank where the water just flows very very slowly through it so that there's no oxygen in it yeah. so the bacteria can then break down the nitrate remove the oxygen and gas off the nitrogen yeah so for the general person water changes the key um and obviously you can get denitrifying media and stuff but I'm, I'm not fully sold on them anyway no. um, now obviously that's it once you start on with your aquarium. Now, we always recommend that people do their own testing at home. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll get someone that's a beginner, they'll probably buy a test kit, they'll start testing the water and they don't fully understand it. So going through step by step what each little bit means. So I think we'll start from the basic one and go with uh, pH. What does pH stand for? It's potential of hydrogen is a technical term. It basically measures the amount of hydrogen ions that's in the water. And it's a logarithmic scale. So if you've got pH 7, which is neutral, which means it's got the same amount of hydrogen, same amount of OH, which basic arithmetic, OH and H gives you H2O, which is water. So if you've got more H+, plus, which is the hydrogen ions, it'll yep. give you pH. And say your pH is six, it's actually got 10 times more hydrogen ions than if it's pH seven due to the logarithmic scale. So that's so it, pretty much how it all works. Um, I mean, that's pretty much covered every question that I had written down for pH. So now I'm in that awkward mind frame of what's my next step. Um, so I think we should just get past that because you covered it all and go to ammonia. So chemical symbol for ammonia um, and what the effects of ammonia are on the fish. Right, well, it's NH3, which is one nitrogen, three hydrogens. And it's highly toxic. It's Ammonia is actually a base. If you think of something like sodium hydroxide, which a lot of people use as drain cleaner. Yep. And ammonia is the same sort of system. It, it, alkali actually burns you the same as acid does, but a lot of people don't know that. Now, if you were to stick your so. hand pure acid, it would burn you. And if you stuck your hand in pure ammonia, it would burn you as well. Hence the reason if you breathe it in, it 
kind of knackers your lungs. Yeah, I mean, I used to be a hairdresser once upon a time, and yeah, we used to do ammonia to certain percentages, and yeah, left on too long, it hurts. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it gets very, very burny. Yeah, works but, similar to acid, but a lot of people don't realise that alkalis burn the same way as acids do. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's, I mean, I can't remember what the pH value of skin is, um, but anything that's too far away from the scale of what it should be will burn. Yes. It will have some form of effect. Yes. Usually they're gills with soft tissues and stuff. Yeah. Like um, humans have lungs, and the gills are basically the fish's lungs, so it affects them. And if they can't breathe, they die. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as bluntly as that as well, but yes, as simply as that. Um, so... Second thing to logically talk about after ammonia is the nitrite. Now, nitrite is one of those that not a lot of people actually know about, yet they know that it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I have read a couple of times now that the nitrite actually binds to the blood vessels of the fish that the oxygen would normally bind to. Therefore, again, starving a fish of having oxygenated blood throughout its body. Now, yeah, that's right. Hopefully, you'd be able to give a little bit more of an insight into that bit. Well, it's NO2, which is actually a highly reactive molecule. So it will take the oxygen away from the tissues inside the fish's body. And again, it will suffocate the fish and stop its, stop its respiration. Yeah, and even small levels of it, like, say if you're going on parts per million, like, say you had ammonia at five parts per million in one tank and nitrite at five parts per million in another, the nitrite one would be the one that would affect the fish quicker and you'd see it much, much quicker. Yeah, it would do, because it would, it would basically stop the, the blood vessels and not working, whereas the, the ammonia takes a wee while to burn has a is more long term effect of pneumonia, but the nitrite is a, a short term effect and kills quicker. Yeah, yeah. So anyone watching this um, that then thinks that that their ammonia has gone down in their aquarium and they're doing the home test kits and with the start of it, um, it's still not safe again because again nitrite is a second step and it's more toxic essentially than the first step. Yes, yeah, that's right. Right, and then. Once all that is broken down and that is at zero, we get into nitrate. Mm -hmm. So, nitrate, what is it? What does it do? How do you love it? Which is a stable compound because the extra electron from the NO2 has been taken up with the extra oxygen. So, although it is toxic and highly to fish, yep. it's not deadly. At small levels, which is why you're okay to have your fish tank at what, be 20, between 20 and 40 parts per million. Yeah, I mean, I know we've touched up on denitrifying filtration systems and denitrifying bacteria. Um, I mean, we think we're pretty much covered the basics of how to get rid of it earlier on, uh, just yeah. shortly before. It's way to do it. Yeah, um, so I think the next one to go from there, so let's talk about KH, the the stability of an aquarium. Now, what is KH? It's the calcium hardness, or carbonate hardness. Should I say, sorry, not calcium, carbonate hardness. And what is the effects on KH in an aquarium? Like, as a basic overall, like, I don't know, I mean, I think anything over a KH of three is a relatively stable aquarium. Yet, say around here, we have a KH of one, what would be the negative effects of a low KH on an aquarium? Well, the carbonate is CO3, carbonate, carbon with three oxygens. And you also have the bicarbonate, which is HCO3, which has got a hydrogen added to it. And if you've got a low carbonate, you end up with a higher bicarbonate, which removes the hydrogen from the water and then increases its pH. 
And if the pH is too high, that's going to be alkaline, which is going to affect your fish. But you also need the carbonate as a buffering system. Yeah. So that if you do have acidic conditions, like some dead fish, rotten plants, too much food, which makes them too much CO2, which fish breathe out, yep. makes them acidic. You need the buffering system to keep your pH level. Yeah, and then we go into aquarium crashes, don't we, after that? So yeah. the crash itself, um, obviously it's when the pH dips to a point where um, the bacteria in the aquarium suffers as well. Uh, so a rapid drop in pH will damage the bacteria in the aquarium and then like, it will essentially start the aquarium again in the nitrogen cycle. How does that yeah. crash itself actually happen? How does it come around? Well, like we said, like rotten vegetation or animal products of any kind will release hydrogen into the water. Yep. Lowers your pH, make it acidic, and the bacteria in the, in the nitrogen cycle can't live in water that's too acidic. It just affects the equilibrium inside the cell of the, the bacteria and they die. It's as simple yeah. as that. So in short, the KH is just as important as the other four, uh, or the other three that we've spoke about. Four. Yeah. Other four levels that we spoke about. Um, so it does need to be constantly monitored, even though it has that name of hardness at the end of it. So things like the general hardness, which is what we're going to come to next, isn't necessarily overly important, but does still play a role. It, uh, people it see does. GH and KH is kind of. The, the end little things to test, the ones that aren't too much of an issue. That's how yeah. people usually see them. Um, so let's go on about the importance of GH and what it actually means. Well, GH is general hardness, which is mostly a mix of the amount of calcium and magnesium that's in your water. Yeah. But they're actually alkaline base metals, is a technical term. Okay. So, and usually you have, well, usually 99% of the time you have more calcium than you do magnesium. Usually about a three to one ratio is the sort of optimum for it. And the calcium is needed for, the well, everybody knows bones are made of calcium. So the fish need the calcium to grow bones and the vertebrates need the calcium to make their shells or exoskeletons. So, but if your KH, which is your carbonate hardness, is too low and your general hardness is too high, you end up with calcium carbonate precipitates because the calcium then binds to the carbonates and you end up with white powder basically in your fish tank. Right, okay. Um, again, that's something I didn't know myself. Now, there is one point that I didn't note down that I think is worthwhile talking about as well. Mm -hmm. So when we add in new wood and botanicals into an aquarium, it grows the bacteria infusoria. Mm -hmm. um, now, is it correct or I don't know how to word it properly, but the infusoria growth does have some form of an effect on either KH or GH when they start to kind of run out of food from the wood themselves, they start feeding off it from the water. Yeah, that's right. So what would be the effect of that in an aquarium? As a slightly more detailed um, view. Well, they remove the, basically they're an, an invertebrate, so they remove the calcium to build their shells. And they're, they don't have bones, but they have shells like so miniature snails and we rotifers and copepods and stuff like that, they all have an exoskeleton so they remove the calcium. So does it have more of an effect on the KH or GH? GH. And then that in turn over time may affect KH? Yes. Magic. They're all interlinked with different parameters and they say the most important thing that I feel with your aquarium is your pH keep it stable, which will then keep all the other things stable. 
Yep, and that is the next step. So we've gone through all of the, well, the, ba the more basic parameters in water quality for the beginner. So they're going to get pretty much anyone, any beginner that will watch this up to now will know exactly how things work. They'll know what everything means and how everything works. So next step for the more advanced water experts, water quality people, fish keepers. Mm -hmm. Fish keepers. We'll just go for fish keepers. Um, so we've covered all the basic parameters and how they work. Uh, what we're going to go into now is the more slightly intermediate side of things. So the relationship between the parameters and how each thing affects each other. Now, as a base kind of level to go from, um, one thing that we've not touched up on yet is temperature. Now, when you're testing for things like ammonia, we'll start from there, the toxicity of the ammonia itself, if you're testing for total ammonia, and you'll have a baseline of free ammonia, um, the pH and the temperature will change the toxicity of that. So we'll start by going through the pH to ammonia, and then we'll move on to like KH to pH, and then the different actual compounds that go into making that change. Right, well, the ammonia, Best way to work out the pH and the ammonia scale is when you get fish shipped to you in a bag, which you obviously do yep. all the time. Yep. The fish release the ammonia into the water in the bag. There's limited oxygen supply. So the pH drops. And because the pH drops, there's more hydrogen ions in the water. So the ammonia turns to ammonium which is NH4 as opposed to NH3. Yep. But a low pH ammonium's not toxic. So you need to make sure that, when you, that everybody talks about the plop and drop method for acclimatizing fish. Yep. So the minute you open the bag, the oxygen goes in, reacts with the spare hydrogen, turns the ammonium into ammonia, which then becomes toxic. The pH rises and there's a load of ammonia there and your fish die. This is all we seem to say, fish die. Yeah, <laughs> you... yeah, they're very, very delicate, very annoyingly delicate little animals. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Some more so than others. Yes, yeah. I mean, we're going to do videos in the future about super soft water fish and super alkaline water fish, hard water fish. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, we're going to do videos about them further down the line, because uh, there's some really, really beautiful soft water fish that I really want to look into and do videos on them as well. So further down the line, we'll go into that. Um, <laughs> I mean, there is one fish that is one of my favorites, which is the black darter tetra, uh, Poecilia corex weitzmanii. Beautiful little tetra thing with kind of the behavior of a drake fin barb and very, very territorial, but they require super soft water in order to actually do much. Mm. But yeah, beautiful little fish, but we're going to go into those on another video later on the line. Um, <laughs> so going back to the relationships between everything. So KH and GH obviously have a very, very firm relationship. Now, mm -hmm. What I want to talk to more into this is the use of buffers in altering KH. Now, things like coral gravel and coral sand. Yeah. It's often get they, it often gets recommended for a buffer to put into your filter or to put onto the substrate, but it doesn't always work. Now, my understanding of it not always working was to do something with the already existing magnesium content in the water. And I can't remember where it goes through from there, but Depending on that content, it doesn't bind properly or doesn't react properly. So well, why see, does coral gravel not always work? Well, you need to have a relationship with the calcium and magnesium of about three to one. Three calcium to one magnesium is your optimum. You can go slightly higher, slightly lower, but that's your optimum level. Yeah. So, but say, like in my wee fish tank just now, I just use eggshell to add calcium to the water, because I've got soft acidic water. But it's mainly calcium carbonates, the best thing to add, like so limestone. Yep. It's the best of both worlds. So you get the calcium 
and the carbonate, which keeps both levels stable, instead of trying to just increase the general hardness without increasing the carbonate hardness. Yeah, so the actual carbonate itself, how does the carbonate come about, the calcium carbonate? Because obviously, like I say, coral gravel is just broken down coral, it's just a skeleton, it's pretty much pure calcium. How does that then change to calcium carbonate in order to affect the KH? It's similar to the, when you're doing the pH, the hydrogen attaches to the carbonate and you get bicarbonate. And if you want the calcium hardness to go up, like general hardness, the calcium will attach to the carbonate ion to give you the calcium carbonate. And the calcium carbonate that forms new shells and corals and things like that. That's what the, the white bits are. So say you had an aquarium and you pour coral gravel in there and it wasn't working. Is it more the fact it's not working yet or more the fact it will not work at all? Probably not working yet because it will dissolve quicker the lower the pH. If you've got quite a high pH, the calcium carbonate in the coral is just not going to dissolve. Yeah. You've already got enough there. And it won't break up the ionic bonds between the calcium and the carbonate. Right, so it is just a case of not working quite yet for the calcium to break down. Yeah. That's something, I, again, I didn't know. Like I knew the basic and the, the relationship between different things, but the actual time and the extra little bits like that was... I may have heard it at one point, but my memory doesn't work anymore. The biggest thing to take is patience. If you're an aquarium keeper, you need patience. Yes, patience is an aquarium, a fish person's best friend. Yeah, you can't do these things overnight. No, and so in order, so when people have watched this video and they realise they've got a low KH, they can work out all these steps in terms of buffering and things like that in, over the time of it happening. Obviously, if you've already got fish in there, it makes it a little bit more difficult as it's a change of water chemistry completely. Yeah. So, going on from the... I had it in my head. The buffering side of things. Now, there are a lot of brands of buffers that are out there. Um, some more so effective than others. Have you worked with buffers much before and do you know which ones you would recommend to people? Well, I wouldn't recommend so much the liquid ones. You're better off with a more stable solid version, yes. which is going to evolve over time because, again, if you put a liquid buffer in, it's going to give you a rapid change, which is not good for anything in the aquarium, be it plants, snails, fish, bacteria, whatever rapid changes is what's the dangerous thing. So you're better off with something like a coral sand or oyster shells or limestone or something that just gradually brings the water up to an equilibrium that you want for your water parameters. Good, good. I mean, I've got a lot of friends and there's a lot of people around this area that we just have all super soft water completely um and i think we've answered most of the questions that people would normally ask me on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of water chemistry and how it works and again the relationships between it all and then the beginner side of things with new customers um so i mean it's we've pretty much covered everything up to an intermediate level now, anything beyond this would just be fancy terminology that I won't understand. So I think that we need to schedule in another video at some point so that I can actually do some of my own research so I can pretend to at least understand or think, or, you know, nod my head and think, I've heard that word before. Yes, there's a real word. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, thank you for taking the time into doing the videos and taking the time into well, out of your stupidly hectic, busy schedule, schedule with being a chemist. Um, I have some... <laughs> good, good. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, we did try and send you some stuff, but apparently no one delivers in Scotland. 
So, oh, they um, do come from Scotland, just not where I live, because I stay in the middle of nowhere, in the sticks, as we call it. See, everyone has lived in the middle of nowhere that we've interviewed so far, but Graham was the one that was lucky enough to get something. Um, so I will send you out a box of chocolates via the post. Oh, thank you very much. I will get you some chocolates and I will make sure that Callum puts that onto his list of things to send people. Yes. Chocolates for Jen. Or Jennifer, which one do you prefer, Jen or Jennifer? Either. Just don't call me Jenny. I mean, I, I, I would never do that. I mean, I was, I was going to. She's allowed to call me that, and that's a very old friend of mine. Not that she's very old, it's just I've known her a long time. <laughs> okay, I mean, hopefully she's not going to watch this and think, hey, that's a bit oh, of an insult, but... Um, no, so I was some... very well, and she knows exactly what I'm saying. So don't oh. worry about it. Thank, thank God I'm not going to get any bad reviews on YouTube, then, because of what you've done. No, so you can call me Jane or Jennifer. I don't mind. Magic. I'll just Jen. Jen Jenny's listing less letters to type, so I'll do that. Right, that's fine. <laughs> um, right, so I've got some quick fire questions for you that we ask everyone. Now, mm -hmm. I think Callum has made my other pad disappear. That's actually got them on. Oh no, they're here. Oh no. Yep. I comp I thought they were genuinely completely lost. So, what is your favourite fish? Um, Kulio. I was going to say, I think you've missed the point of quick fire. So, to do, I was, I ask the question, straight answer, no thinking. All right. Oh, is this the five second rule? Right. I've played these games with kids before. Right. Okay. Right. Yes. Go for it. Right. So, we'll ignore favourite fish one. That's Cooley Loach. We'll do that one. Most hated fish. Goldfish. Favourite fish up? Yours. <laughs> Did you just say yours because you forgot the name briefly? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has said that. So let's, let's like, what your local favourite fish shop? The one that you uh, would go to all the time. It's the one that Tam's bringing near that I can't remember the name of it. This remembering Cor names is a common thing, isn't it? Uh -huh. I don't know where that is, but I don't know how to get there, but I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> all right, well, maybe. If you think about it, Callum can put it on and we'll do a little link to them as well. Just give them a little quick shout out. So your biggest inspiration in the hobby? YouTube. YouTube? Just yeah. general or was any specific names or just a general looking at videos and things like that and taking things from that? Just general boredom busting videos. Okay. Okay. That was, yeah. Um, oh, one last question, actually. One last one. If you were to have any aquarium of any size with any species of fish in it, doesn't just have to be one, what would be your dream aquarium? Six foot tank with discus, cooly loaches, and rummy nose tetras. Nice, basic, but simplistic. What kind mm -hmm. of decoration would you have in that? Like well planted or kind of? Very well planted. Well, so you'd go for the, the jungle look and not the drought style look that's bare bones and... Oh, no. I can't stand bare bones tanks, they're boring. They are very, very boring. I mean, the fish are there. People do things to advance the fish as far as possible. But if the fish aren't comfortable, they'll never be at their best. No, as I say, if I get somewhere to hide, you'll see them more. Exactly, exactly. Which is a, the background of what you want it to happen. Like hiding, you want them to hide, but hiding makes them comfortable enough to come out when they feel they don't need to. Yes. Magic. I'm, I've kind of held my own with a chat about water quality, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> I knew what I knew what we were talking about, apart from the what, two or three times that I, I, I was genuinely kind of struck with more information. So um, I think we can pretty much end it now so i'm gonna finish up with saying thank you for having me yeah, thank you <laughs> thank you for taking your, the time out of your day and thank you for being such a good sport in terms of the video and what's quality and allowing people to get knowledge from yourself not a problem and now you know this video will ever be immortalized and you will always be on the internet teaching everyone about water quality so well done you. 
thank you. <laughs> now, anytime anyone asks you, just give them a link to me. Yes, of course I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, before we go, um, obviously you do, is it admin with Aquarium Adventures on Graham? Pardon? Do you do admin with Aquarium Adventures on his um, live chats and things like that? Yeah, I'm one of the moderators. Okay, so uh, just a bit more, obviously we talk about Graham and talk to Graham quite a bit, um, but seeing as though you're here, uh, Graham's live chats that you're the moderator on, when do they start and how often are they? Um, it's, at the moment it's every Friday night from approximately 9 till 11. Yeah, he does. He does talk on for quite a while. Um, so, if anyone wants a link, <laughs> if anyone does want a link to that, I'm sure Callum will put a link into the Aquarium Adventures page again, and people can head over to Graham's live streams on a Friday night uh, between nine and eleven. Um, and also, all I'm going to say is share the video around, get everyone to like and subscribe, teach everyone about water quality, and yeah, let's educate the world one video at a time. Let's go for it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll get Callum to send you stuff out in the post as soon as possible. All right. Thank you very much. What's your favourite chocolate, though, first? Plain chocolate. Plain chocolate. Fancy chocolate, or you like it simple as anything? Like simple or uncomplicated chocolate? I just, it doesn't matter what's inside, as long as it's plain chocolate. Easy. I'll go up to Thornton soon. It's only up the road. <laughs> well, you're lucky ever thought and shut. Um, <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's probably the fourth time I'm going to say goodbye, but thank you very much for your time, Jen. Right, thank you. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. See you later.